May we pray? Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by that same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. When I was seven years old, my father was appointed to be the pastor of First Methodist Church Gatesville. That's right, it was First Methodist Church. That was before the, the unification. Uh, some folks say, well, I've been a United Methodist all my life. And, and I'm saying, well, if you are over the age of 52, no, you have not been a Methodist, or 54, I guess now. But anyway, you have not been a, a Methodist, all of you, United Methodist all your life. There was a time when uh, it was just First Methodist. And my dad was pastor of First Methodist Church in Gatesville. It's a county seat town about 40 miles west of Waco on Highway 84. And we were moving there from Bell Mead, Texas. Now, Bell Mead is a suburb on the east side of Waco. And when we lived in, in uh, Bell Mead, I had a, 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 a boundary that was about two blocks long on, e on either side. And to cross Hogan Lane, busy, busy Hogan Lane, two blocks north of the Parsonage, was just verboten. It was absolutely forbidden. So when we got to, to Gatesville, there were no boundaries set yet. And so as mom and dad unpacked the boxes and started putting things away, I got on my bicycle and began to explore the new community for myself. I found the city park and I found the, the swimming pool where I would almost drown that summer. But I learned my way around the city. The only problem was that I did not have permission to leave the house. My mother did not know where I was. And so needless to say, when I returned home with excitedly about my scouting report, mom wasn't pleased, you know. Now, it wasn't the last time that, uh, that I was counted AWOL, but it was certainly one of the most memorable, memorable because what we know is that pleasing our mothers is always important. But what I want to point out this morning is that pleasing God is even more important. So the question for today is, is God pleased with us? Now, many of us live our lives in an attempt to please God. We read our devotionals, we pray, we attend worship, we attend Sunday school, we might even attend committee meetings or we, we sing in the choir. And in all of these ways, we are, we are anticipating that our actions please God. But read the scripture with me again. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So let's, let's approach it from that standpoint. Does very much of what we do really require faith? And you say, well, I certainly wouldn't pray if I didn't have faith that God would answer, God would hear me. And I would reply, well, I certainly wouldn't show up at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning if I didn't think that there might be some folks here in the congregation for me to preach on. But honestly, how much faith do we truly exercise in the weekly routine of our religion? Does it require really anything more of us than, say, the Lions Club or Rotary Club or whatever civic or social organization we may, we may be a part of? We're continuing our sermon series this morning on experiencing God, knowing and doing the will of God. And each week we have added what Henry Blackaby calls a reality. And he uses a diagram to illustrate each reality. Reality one says God is always at work around you. Reality two, God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. Reality three, 
God invites you to become involved with him in his work. And reality four says God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. And so returning to the question of does what we really require, what we really do, require faith, I remember a quote from the original video series of Experiencing God. It said, Blackaby says, if what you are doing in your local church does not require faith, then no matter what you think you are achieving, you are not pleasing God. Now I'm going to go off script for just a moment, so I'm going to tell Shelly she's going to have to refocus the, the, uh, the camera. When I arrived here a little over a month ago, my first Saturday night, I received a call requesting that we have a, a time of prayer for Corey my, that first Sunday morning. And I really felt the Holy Spirit moving at that particular time that this was something important to us as a congregation. It was something important to Corey. And so many of you remember that we had the kneeler, Corey came forward, I anointed him with oil, I read from James chapter 5, many of you came forward and prayed for Corey. A week later, we had a community service of prayer and healing, healing and wholeness. And then my third Sunday here, I got a request from another member that I anoint her and I pray for her. And I began to see a pattern developing. And I was, I was feeling like that we have a wonderful altar time at the close of every service. Maybe God was calling me to, to have a time specifically, a place for anointing and for prayer, for healing. Well, last week, again, we continued it. And I, I've got to tell you, I was at Sacramento with a bunch of other ministers on this week, the early part of this week. Tuesday night, I went to bed confident that Corey was receiving his healing. So you can imagine that Wednesday morning when I woke up and one of the other ministers told me that Corey had died during the night, it was a gut punch. It's almost like, what did we do the anointing for? What good did it do? Should we even continue it? Well, the worship committee last week had already decided that we will make that a part of our, our worship service going forward. But you see, it takes faith, even in the face of a prayer that seems to be denied, although, from Corey's perspective, he received the healing that all ultimately all of us anticipate and all of us know. If what you're doing in your local church does not require faith, then no matter what you think you are achieving, you're not pleasing God. My belief, my prayer, is that by continuing to offer anointing and prayer is a way of expressing our faith that God has not abandoned us, that God has not somehow turned his back on the promise that we would be able to pray and receive healing. In the book of Judges, we read about Gideon. When Gideon agreed to God's plan to defeat the Midianites, he had no idea how God was going to do, how God was going to, to do that. He just moved forward in faith. If God had told him, now when he was hunkered down in that wine press, that God was going to conquer the Midianites with 300 men, he might have thought, well, I don't think I'm fit for that. But instead, what Gideon do, did is he blew his trumpet and he summoned the Abizarites to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali. And the Lord said to, to, to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into the hair hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. So Gideon reduced the number by, by, by 22,000 down to 10,000. And God said he still had too many. 
So Gideon took the men to, down to the water, and there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs, and the rest got down on their knees to drink. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go home. So with 300 men, Gideon defeated the, defeated the enemy. When we commit to following God's leadership, God gives us God-sized assignments. When I was appointed to be the pastor of First United Methodist Church in Euless, Texas, in February of 2006, the first week that I was there, the mayor of the city called and invited me to come to City Hall where uh, she gave me a tour of City Hall, of the library. We went over to the Texas Star Golf Course, a very wonderful, beautiful golf course in, in the heart of the mid-cities. And then she took me to lunch at Texas Star, a wonderful, uh, wonderful luncheon. And as we are walking out on the parking lot, as I am walking over to my car, she says, and oh, by the way, the fire marshal wants to talk to you. Well, I did not know what that meant until the fire marshal talked with me, and I found out that when the church added up a, 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 a section to their, to their educational wing, uh, they signed an agreement with the city of Euless that they would put a fire sprinkler system in their sanctuary. Now, before that, it had been grandfathered, but because they had done this addition, According to the laws, according to the regulations, they had to put a fire sprinkler system in their sanctuary. When I got to Euless, I found out that not only did they not have a plan for the fire sprinkler system or a plan to pay for a fire sprinkler system, they were three months in violation of that agreement. So a couple of months later, six of us went to a stewardship uh, uh, seminar there in the mid-cities. And we began to feel the Holy Spirit calling us to do a capital campaign to raise money not just for, the, for, for the, the fire sprinkler system, but for a lot of other needs. Well, for one thing, uh, they were not making their, they were not meeting their, their monthly uh, mortgage payment, and they were taking money out of the organ fund in order to pay for their mortgage payment. So you kind of see the situation that the church was in. Well, in Euless, a broad representation of the congregation provided leadership and communication and it created expectation, it created a excitement and they set three goals. They set a bronze goal of about $425,000. They set a, a silver goal of about $525,000 and then the, 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 uh, the gold was $650,000. Well, the church surpassed their top goal of $650,000. People stepped out in faith, believing that God wanted to accomplish greater things than they had been anticipating, so the people stepped up. And then, shortly after the campaign ended, the church signed a $212,000 gas lease, which enabled the church to, to totally renovate the, the, the church gym and to recarpet the sanctuary. And both of those projects involved asbestos abatement. And you know how much that, how expensive that is. But the thing that struck me was I have spent many, many years in ministry in oil and gas country. And it took going to the heart of the mid-cities to sign a gas lease for the church. They had 12 acres, and so uh, Chesapeake wanted to, uh, wanted to give us some money, and so we agreed to, to, to uh, sign the gas lease. The reason I tell you that is because I have seen throughout my ministry that God has proven to me that he can bring money and resources from places that I have no clue about 
But my first responsibility is simply to believe that he will act. What Blackaby says rings so true. God does not need to provide one cent to what we're not committed to do. Let me read that again. God does not need to provide one cent to what we're not committed to do. So if God calls us to do something, God will provide the funds to do it. But first, we must believe that he exists. Now, that may sound ridiculous, but the writer to the Hebrew knew that belief in God's existence was imperative to, to the faith. For some, the existence of God as, is as obvious as the rays of a sunset or the colors of the rainbow. But the meaning of this particular passage goes much deeper. In some ways, I believe the King James Version more accurately captures the meaning of the section when it says, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Okay, so Moses believed that God existed. Okay, but when God appeared to him in the burning bush, Moses' belief was redefined. God gave Moses a name by which to call him. God said, I am. So when the writer of Hebrews says, he is, he uses the same expression. Now, that may not be the easiest train of thought to follow, but the point I want to make is fundamental. When God moves from being just simply a, a concept or an abstraction to a personal relationship, he gives God-sized assignments. Moses went from leading sheep in the wilderness to leading an entire nation through the wilderness. He learned that when you hear from God, God gives God-sized assignments. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor in World War II, instructions were sent from Franklin D. Roosevelt to the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox. And it was just a very simple <coughs> one-sentence phrase. He said, tell Nimitz, <coughs> that is Admiral Nimitz, tell Nimitz to get, to, to, to get the H to Pearl and to stay there until the war is won. Well, Nimitz assumed command of the Pacific Fleet on November 31st, 1941. And from that day on, he carried the fight to the enemy. And his superb leadership and the valor of more than 2 million American fighting men and women culminated on the, desk, on the deck of the USS Missouri four years later as he signed the Japanese surrender as the commander-in-chief of the largest naval armada ever assembled. When Nibbets heard from President Roosevelt, he was given an enormous assignment. It was one which Roosevelt knew, for, knew he was suited for, and it was one which Nimitz accomplished with distinction. When we believe God is who he says he is, he gives us assignments that are God-sized. That is how the world comes to know God. In Unit 7 of Experiencing God, there's a rather scathing indictment, and I quote it here as food for thought, although it may give you a little bit of, of indigestion. Our world is not attracted to the Christ we serve because they are not seeing him at work in our lives. They see us doing good things for God and comment, that's nice, but it's not my thing. The world is passing us by because they do not want to get involved in what they see in our lives. We're not giving them opportunities to encounter God. They are seeing only us. Let the world watch God at work and he will attract people to himself. Let Christ be lifted up, not in words, but in life. Let people see the difference the living Christ makes in life a family, or a church. That will affect how they respond to the gospel. When the world see th sees things happening through God's people that cannot be explained except that God himself has done them, then the world will be drawn to such a God, to, to such a God they see. Do, do, do you understand that? We sometimes wonder why our sanctuaries aren't full. 
But if you think about it, all the people around us see is those nice little things that we do for other people. And that doesn't attract them. But when they see God doing God-sized things, they begin to wonder and they're drawn. Reality 5 says God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. So how do we make the move from belief that he exists to action that draws the world to him? Well, we must believe that he rewards those who seek him. Has God ever rewarded you for your faith? Do you have a story about how God has rewarded your faith? I would love to hear about your faith experiences. I love the story from the workbook that Henry Blackaby tells about a church in Saskatoon that was growing and needed money for a building project. And they felt that God was leading them to start the program, but they only had $749 in their building fund. And the building was going to cost $220,000. And they had no idea where they were going to get it. They did a lot of the work themselves to save costs on the cost of labor. But halfway through the building program, they were still $100,000 short. So the congregation looked to their pastor for confidence that the God who was leading them would show them how he would do it. God began providing the funds, but then they were still $60,000 short near the end. They'd been expecting money from a foundation in Texas. And this is how Henry Blackaby talks about it. Delay after delay occurred that we could not understand. And then one day for two hours, the currency exchange rate for the Canadian dollar hit the lowest point in history. That was exactly the time the Texas Foundation wired the money to Canada. That gave us $60,000 more than we would have received otherwise. Afterward, the Canadian dollar went back up in value. Does the Heavenly Father look after the economy in order to help his children? Nobody in the world would believe that God did no one in the world would believe that God did for that one church. But I can show you a church that believes God did it. And when that happened, I magnified what the Lord had done in the eyes of the people. I made sure that we gave him the credit. God revealed himself to us and we came to know him in a new way through that experience. What did God do in that situation? He proved himself faithful to his word. Our text says, And without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. My question to you is, are you earnestly seeking him? If you are, then life is full of a great reward. May we pray.